tall, gangly thing? What's up, everybody? This is Gangly, Nick DePasquale, and this is Hyrule Radio Insights. This is a different kind of show. Uh, a lot of people who maybe subscribe to the podcast right now are used to Hyrule Radio, the call-in show, where I bring in a couple different guests, and we have callers or viewers call in live. We talk about their opinions live on stream. But I wanted to try and do some content that's a bit more short form, um, but also is a bit more relaxed, a bit different than a lot of the content that I do in the past. And so I came up with this idea of Hyrule Radio Insights. And what this is, is going to be a 20 or 30 minute series where it's just me talking to my microphone about the things that I really want to talk about in competitive TFT. And one thing I really want to do is talk about player history. That's going to be a recurring uh, series in, in Hyrule Radio Insights. And so thinking about it, I wanted to figure out where's the best place to start with with this series. And I asked some people in Discord, and actually Kana, shout out to Kana, recommended Sox. I think Sox is a fantastic place to start. Sox has a very, very rich history in competitive TFT. Um, and I think a lot of people, while they may know more about him in recent years, may not know about his past or kind of how, how much of an influence Sox really was on TFT and where we are today. So I'm going to be taking a look at Sox's history from set one all the way to set seven. Um, I also have, if you're watching the video version of this uh, next to me, the tournament results of Sox from, from then until now. Uh, one thing to note is that I actually could not confirm that he did not play in the set two finale. So if, there, if that is different, then I will make a comment either on YouTube or in the description of the podcast later on. Um, but we're just going to be taking a look at his performances from, from the beginning of competitive TFT all the way until now. And along the way, we're also going to be talking about the things that he has personally developed in the game, whether it's through meta, through concepts, or um, tournament results. So let's just get right into it. I think we'll just kind of find our way from there. But we'll talk about set one. Set one was an interesting time in TFT. Obviously, there were not really any tournaments. There was Twitch Rivals, which set, uh, Sox did not play on. Um, we'll talk more about Twitch Rivals in an episode where I cover a player who was competing in it. So for right now, I'll just kind of talk about his ladder performance. Um, set one was the first time that Sox hit rank one. And I'll talk about it when we talk more about set two, but ladder really was the only metric of how good a player was back then. There were no tournaments, there was no competitive structure. And so Sox was not a player who was dominant on ladder. He was not a player who consistently crushed the ladder and was always rank one. He hit it for like a day and that was it. Because we had no tournaments going on at the time, there wasn't that much to really know about mismatched Sox. So Set one, there's really not too much history. He wasn't developing anything groundbreaking in the scene. He didn't dominate the ladder, uh, and he didn't compete in any tournaments. And it wasn't until set two, which we can move on to now, where Sox really started to make his mark. Now, it's important to understand the landscape of TFT back then. People are familiar with the concept of playing flexibly, or building boards rather than just set compositions now. But back in set two, that really wasn't a thing. In fact, Sox was one of the pioneers of flex play in North America. And a lot of people who are more familiar with, with set two might think of Summoner Assassin. Some Sin Comp was one of the most flexible comps and really changed the way people saw units in the game. But Sox was famous for playing flex in a different composition, which was Poison Rangers. And if you're not, if you're not familiar with set two, I'll just give a, a quick recap, which really this was a super flexible board um, that required maybe three, I think, units to play. And for the most part, it was just flexing four and five cost units. And so up until this point, people are playing compositions with a set end game. I'm playing Berserkers. Okay, well, I got to get, get my six Berserkers. I got to get Olaf, got to get three items on them. This is how I play the game, and this is how I top four. But for Sox, it was more about how do I get to a high level? and then build a board with high value units who I know are good in multiple contexts. And this introduction of flex play really was a gigantic development in, in how we would con continue to see um, strength in TFT. Now, I talked about this before, that ladder was the only metric really of how good a player was back then. 
Mismatched Socks held both rank one and rank two on the ladder back then for like a month straight. In fact, I remember when I was getting into the scene back then, I was like a silver player. And I was like, I want to climb, I want to climb. And I looked at the ladder and I saw Mismatched Socks was like 1800 LP and 1600 LP or something like that on his two accounts. And I remember thinking, even if I get to Masters, I'm actually closer to silver than I am to mismatched socks. The gap between the high elo community back then versus like the, the, the casual player was so huge because the people who were playing this game and really developing these, these things in the meta um, that would shape the game in the future, they were just thinking about the game on a whole new level. Nobody really thought about flex play the way socks did back then. And I know there are players like Goose. I've actually I've heard Kuramex. Um, being attributed as a, a large Sumsin player who who drove the meta in North America. And we'll talk, I think Sumsin, Sumsin is probably an episode in of itself we should get to. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long. Um, but like I said, dominant force on ladder, held one and two. No tournament results unless set two finale, maybe he did compete. I have to, I have to confirm that um, and I will make sure that's in the show notes or the comments or something. Hey, it's me. I'm back. I actually, right after finishing recording this video, found out that Sox did play in the set two finale and placed sixth out of 32. Um, so wish I had known that about half an hour ago, but it's OK. Now, you know, he actually did perform in the only set two tournament that was available. Sixth place out of 32, making final day again. So not surprised to see that, but important context for you to enjoy the rest of the episode. OK, with that, uh, let's move into set three. Um, set three, I actually know, it's probably the set that I know the least about in terms of competitive. So bear with me. And if, and if there's something that I say that isn't correct, feel free to correct me in the comments or, or shoot me a message on Discord or something. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But I did talk a little bit to Bryce Blum, um, who is a huge Sox fan in, in set three. And what we've established already in set two about Sox bringing flex play to North America is even further established in set three. Um, set three, I personally remember, I think it was probably three, not 3.5. That had like the kale composition. I remember watching Soju once and someone's like, oh, what comp are you playing? And Soju is like all the broken units. And that's kind of that's kind of a basic introduction to what flex play is, where it's you're playing the units. You're not playing a composition. You're playing boards that work regardless of whether that is your standard end game or not. Um, but it's interesting to note that despite the fact that Sox was known as the best flex player in North America, when regionals came around, everything changed. He played the Yasuo Master Yi reroll composition, um, which whose name I won't use on this podcast. I'll call it the Bash Bros. If you're if you're a Mighty Ducks fan, that's the Bash Bros. Um, and he one tricked a reroll composition, which is crazy to think about when you're talking about just the best flex player in North America, who all of a sudden says, it's actually better if I just one trick this comp because it's that broken. And if I can get it uncontested every game, I'm just going to I'm just going to make it to Worlds. Um, and so Sox masters this reroll composition. And in the final day of regionals goes two, 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 uh, and ultimately gets second because he loses the checkmate format to uh, an oceanic player, I believe, um, but was first in points scored. So interesting distinction there was second place in the tournament, but was first if you're just going by points scored, makes it to world, um, but ultimately is not spending as much time on the game from what I understand. And Bash Bros is nerfed and he does, I think, decide to play flex. Ultimately, Sox does not show up at, at set three worlds in the way that some people might have expected if he was in his more flex form um, that he had shown in earlier parts of the set or or uh, even in set two. Now, set four comes around, and this is the golden age of socks. I have it here. There are five tournaments in set four, qualifier one, two, three, four, and then regionals. Out of these five tournaments, socks one competes in every single event, and he makes final day in four of them, going fifth, Second, 15th, which is his only non-final day, then third, and second place at regionals. Sox was by far, beyond the shadow of a doubt, both statistically and known by the players themselves as the best player 
in set four. It may be up to debate by some people. By my standards, I, it's not even close. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about the statistics of it in a little bit. But just by the results, nobody has ever really shown the consistency Sox had in set four. Because even if you compare it to players like Robin or Spencer in set five, the number of tournaments they entered just wasn't the same. Sox was entering everything, and he was always putting up results. Even in the tournament where he places 15th, not a bad result. It's not like he got day one. It's not like he, he you know, bustered out immediately in the event. Getting day two, nothing to be ashamed of. Still a decent result in what I think was a 32-person event. Middle of the pack. If your worst performance in a game of variance is middle of the pack, you were doing something great. So, <clears throat> ultimately, he does qualify for Worlds, gets day two at Worlds. I know he attributed it quite a bit to low roll and said he probably could have done a little bit better, but for the most part, uh, kind of, you know, could not have done all that much better. That's up to debate. I didn't watch his VODs. I'm not good enough to really make that call myself. But I think it's interesting to note that the player who was able to perform in tournament all year long did go to, to, to Worlds. Made it out of day one, got day two, and pretty close. He, he wasn't like the next in line from what I remember, but he was relatively close to making day three. Um, but this is where things get crazy, okay? Let's talk about tournament stats. I So not all of the tournaments, the, the score sheets are available, but I can still see the, the point totals um, in a lot of them. So I was able to estimate his average placement across, across set four. And first thing to note is he played 87 games. That is from what I have seen or what the data I've collected so far personally. Nobody else has ever played that many games in tournament before in a single set. Um, maybe in set six, that number is higher for some people who have entered every single event. But in set four, we had like a four day regionals. We had multiple three day events. So there was just a lot of TFT being played in tournament. This is where it's interesting. 87 games, he averaged a 3.73. Now, that is not a perfect number because, again, I had to estimate certain scores based on points. If we had been using the 1 through 8 scoring system, I could have gotten a perfect number, but because it was 1 through 10, I had to just guess on certain things. But 3.73 average placement over 87 games. Keep in mind, from the data I've collected from set 6 and 7, no one else has had that that um, sample size and players who are kind of in a similar realm are set six spicy appies who averaged 3.95 over 73 games. So again, uh, 15 games fewer or and 0.2 placements lower or goobums uh, in set six who had a 3.79. And again, Sox had 3.73, but goobums only had 62 games. So now we're talking about 25 game difference. Every single game that you play in tournament should be getting you closer and closer to 4.5. That is the middle point. And if you're saying that the player skill in uh, among the best are pretty similar, then every single game should be getting you closer and closer to the middle point. So the fact that Sox has what I have seen as the best average placement with the highest sample size pretty clearly in my mind indicates that Sox was beyond the shadow of a doubt, infinitely better than the rest of North America in set four. I, to the point where I actually think that if you run regionals 10 times with Sox in the field, it's probably something like 40 or 50% of the time Sox makes it to Worlds. And I, I'm, I'm making that number just based off of intuition from the data I've seen. I'm sure someone could actually calculate that. I did put it in Sox's um, program that he had developed at the end of set six, but I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is. But I actually do think, I, I, I would bet that like 40% of the time, Sox making final day is, is actually what I should say, not, not worlds, but Sox making final day um, at regionals is probably like 40 or 50% of the time, maybe even higher, maybe like 60% of the time, because his average placement is so much better with such a higher sample size, 90 games, if you looked at 90 games on lol chess of someone playing in solo queue and and didn't and weren't convinced by their results, 
then you would be known to just have a bias against them. People look at the last 20 games of someone on LOL Chess and all of a sudden say, oh no, it clicked for them. They get it. They're a good player. 90 games is four and a half times that. And to me is a pretty clear indication that Mismatch Sock's 3.7 average is probably relatively close to his true average placement. And keep in mind, that's a total average placement across the entire set, which means that on the patches where it really clicks for him, that average is probably higher. And if regionals is played on a patch where things really click for, for Sox, you might be looking at an average placement of 3.4, 3.5, which makes that number of 40 or 50% even higher. So Sox in set four was truly the golden age of mismatched Sox. And I wanna make sure that I really drive this home, that he was just thinking about the game differently. I remember watching a video Doa put out called Galaxy Brain, where he sits down with mismatched Sox and they VOD review. And Sox is talking about things like rolling off cadence at like 3-3, because if it opens you up to high roll before carousel, where maybe you can find a four cost pair. All of these things that now are seen maybe a little bit more often, but back then, I, I don't remember seeing anybody rolling on 3-3. That's something that you're either really bad or so good that you just get it and nobody else does. So Sox was very much the driving force in a lot of things that I would just put under the bucket of critical thinking. He brought critical thinking to TFT because he didn't just do what everybody else was doing. He thought about the game and, you know, did what made sense to him because he had the confidence to know that if this makes sense to me, it's probably good because I know what I'm talking about. I didn't talk about this before, and I want to just backtrack to set three again, that Sox was also a driving force of the RE positioning. And, and it connects to the point I was just making about um, critical thinking, where Sox essentially put out a guide about how everybody was positioning RE incorrectly, and he, he had reasons for why his positioning worked better, why it was optimal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this wasn't uncommon. Sox has videos all on YouTube about small tricks in TFT or small optimizations that he sees that a lot of people just don't notice. Um, he's a careful player who understands the unit interaction that gives him just a deeper understanding of the game. And this, in my opinion, is the main reason why he was able to build such a gap between him and the rest of the field in set four. Because with the chosen system, you, had, you, you were able to leverage um, power spikes at different points in the game where all of a sudden you have a, an enhanced two-star unit. And if you can use those chosens at any point in the game and know all the different lines that come out of that chosen, well then you just have the edge over the player who's waiting for their perfect chosen. We'll move on now to what I think is probably the decline of mismatched socks. Set, set five comes and right off the bat, fourth place of the first challenger series. Fantastic result. First Challenger Series in particular was actually the hardest out of all of them, um, just in terms of the quality of the field, because everyone was trying to, um, I think it actually qualified them for mid-set finale, which is interesting that he didn't compete. I'll have to double check that to see if, if my data here is right. But after Challenger Series fourth place, Sox starts to take a dip. He's not climbing as hard. People are saying that, yes, when he's in form, he's good, but he, you know, his, his partner is pregnant. He's having a child. He's not, his work is getting crazy. He's not able to devote as much time to the game. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of Ogre 1 back in the Halo 2, Halo 3 days, if, if any of my listeners followed Halo. But Ogre 1 was a dominant player in Halo 1 and 2. Halo 3 comes out. Final Boss wins the first major of Halo 3. But immediately after that, they start to fall off. Ogre one retires. He's not really in the same form that he was, whatever, you know, back in, in Halo 2. And loses that reputation a little bit. And I think that kind of is a similar trajectory that Sox seems to take in set five. Um, ultimately, people's expectations start to dwindle over time in set five, uh, even to the point where I remembered Bryce Blum and Soju having a wager or a fantasy draft on... Um, I forget what podcast. It wasn't Don't, don't Talk If You Don't Know, because I think it was before that, whatever it was, where Soju drafts Sox and all these other players. And I remember Bryce being vocal about the fact that you are you are highly, highly over-indexing on mismatched Sox and where he is right now versus where he used to be. And this is someone from Bryce who I know very much respects Sox. 
Um, but the, the truth is come, come regionals where there's only 18 competitors, a lot of people were not confident, myself included. Actually, I put him in an honorable mention, but wasn't actually one of the players that I thought was going to be a threat um, at regionals. And he, he gets day one, um, gets 10th out of 18. So, or, or 16, I should say. Set six comes around and tilt over cup. Very interesting because I actually think this is like the tipping point for where people start to really doubt socks. Because because up until now, it's like a slow trajectory, but there's not a lot of tournament. And tilt over cup socks is rank one, if I remember correctly. He's dominating on ladder and then gets day one, essentially, at tilt over cup because he had he had um, gotten a buy into the second weekend. And, and he loses immediately in that in that first day, does not make final day. And then a couple months later, Challenger Series gets day one again, 13th place. And, and at this point in time, mismatched Sox has had a string of poor results that are so highly contrasting his results in set four that people are starting to say, mismatched Sox is one of the greats of the game because of who he was, not who he is now. And he's able to bounce back, you have to give him credit, with a great performance at Zong Cup. Um, and for the rest of set six, has middle of the pack results, a bit higher at some points, a bit lower at, at others. 15th place at mid-set finale, 24th place at the Innovation Cup, 10th place at regionals. Oh, and if I didn't say it before for audio listeners, he got fifth place at Zong Cup, which was second in the final day because of the way they had lobby set up. Um, so 24th at Innovation, 10th place at Regionals, almost makes final day, but doesn't quite show up. So set six is interesting because, in my opinion, it shows us what set five would have shown us if Sox had continued playing in tournaments, but he just didn't have the sample size, which is he can still be great and he can still reach those high highs. He's just not doing it consistently anymore because there's not a gap. He, he's he's now in a place where he's a great player, but great players in TFT often have bad tournaments because it's a game of variance. He's no longer gapping the rest of the field in the way that he was in set four or in the way that many people would probably say spicy appies and goo bums were in set six or the way that I would argue Pocky Gom was in set seven. Um, so Sox continues to be... Um, a great player with, with middle of the pack results in set six. Now let's move on to the most recent set, set seven, because I want to wrap this up relatively soon. And Mismatch Sox comes out of the gate swinging with a first place finish at the Astral Cup. And everything I've just said about set five and set six, him being a great player, but he can have bad results. You know, he, he comes out of the gate to shut the haters up, and he actually does it. I mean, he, he places first. Uh, alongside Asa, who also took places in the top four. And there's this interesting dynamic of these two players studying together and practicing together. I, I referred to it on the Jade Cup broadcast as this Mr. Miyagi and Daniel LaRusso type relationship. Of, uh, you know, it almost feeling like Sox, the great mind of TFT, feeding into the, the next generation, if it's fair to say that about Asa, who I know is not actually that young, but is a newer player in the scene. And together we see Sox and Asa perform incredibly well in this tournament. And now for the rest of the, of the set, Sox kind of goes back to where he was in set six, which is middle of the pack results, 45th place at the Jade Cup, 22nd place at mid-set finale. But it's interesting to note that when you look at the power rankings, people are back to having Sox as a threat. People are expecting so Sox to perform again. And I don't know if this is if this is accurate or if this is actually a good call because even in set five and six, when I think Sox was not on top of his game and was not gapping the rest of the players, he could still reach those high highs. Challenger series with a fourth place, Zon Cup with a fifth place or second place in the final lobby. Sox was always able to reach those high highs. It's a question now of can he continue to do it consistently? Um, so I don't know what the future holds for for Sox, but when I look at his history, I see a player who single-handedly brought large meta developments to the game in the form of flex play. Um, I see someone who is always on the cutting edge of how to approach the game. I remember there's like these clips of Sox, again, like with the positioning for Ari or like the critical thinking or him just 
uh, being highly inflammatory towards other top players because they just don't get the game like he does. Um, Sox is a loud voice in the scene. He's an opinionated player, and he also has the historical data to back him up. I think that Sox is placed in the scene personally, and this is not this is not an absolute truth. This is just my personal opinion that Sox will probably always be able to reach the high highs. I don't think he's ever going to gap the players like he did back in set four, because I honestly think people have just learned too much from him already. People have seen Sox play so much. They've spoken to him about the game so much. I don't know that he still has the same edge over the players because the, the general knowledge of the average top level player has just gone up because of players like him. I actually think that it may be up to somebody else to bring some new meta developments that Sox can apply into his gameplay um, to really see his flex play at the top consistently gapping the rest of the top players. Um, and I, I wrote this closing thought, and I think this is probably the best way to kind of end this video, which is there isn't a giant gap between Sox and the rest in the field anymore, but he has already cemented his legacy as the flex player of North American TFT and is one of the most respected competitors that we'll ever see in North American TFT history. And that's, that's what I think is the best way to summarize Sox. Without Sox, the game in North America would be different because he pioneered so much of what we consider to be standard today in the game. Um, and without a player like him, it would be up to somebody else to step up who, you know what, the truth is, maybe they wouldn't have found it in the same way. Maybe the game would look different. We have a lot that we owe Sox in terms of how we see TFT today. Uh, and I'm very thankful that we have a player like that in our scene. And the last thing I wanted to do, actually, is I just wanted to talk a little bit about the stats of set seven. I meant to do this before. I'll just do this real quickly. Sox, like I said, is is a great player, maybe not gapping everyone. Um, and by the numbers, kind of exactly where I'm, what I'm saying, among players with 22 games or more, which is the metric I use because it means that you made um, two different days of competition twice, he's 25th out of 64 players. So he's above average, not gapping people like Amda or Pakigam or Milk are in tournament. Um, but still a very, very strong tournament threat and someone who we all know could make final day, make a run for world. Nobody would be surprised to see Sox making 7.5 world. And in fact, I think people would be incredibly, incredibly excited to see him back on the world stage. So that wraps up Hyrule Radio Insights, episode number one on Mismatch Sox. Um, so I just want to thank everyone. I took a little break from content creation uh, to focus on some personal stuff going on. And I'm trying to find now more healthy ways to create content in, in the time that I have in my personal life. Um, and one of the things I'm also trying to do is accepting the fact that I, I want to open myself up for a bit more support. Um, the best way to support the podcast is subscribing on YouTube, subscribing on wherever you find your podcast, if it's Spotify or the Apple podcast um, application, um, just make sure you get notifications for it because I'd love to see people coming out of the woodwork and commenting first and things like that. You can also find me on TikTok. I, I was making a ton of TikTok content back in the summer. I think I'm going to pick that up again for 7.5. And last thing I launched is that I just put together a Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash gangly. I'll also have it in the description of everything that I'm putting up. Um, but you can find couple different interesting perks that I have there, like answering questions live on my content, um, getting a shout out at the end of, of different pieces of content. But also, I'm going to be making exclusive episodes of Hyrule Radio Insights that are only accessible to um, certain tiered members. Uh, and I, this may be things like the stats behind first or eighth players or talking about the eras of TFT and the large meta developments that, that really shape the history of the game. Um, so check out our my, my, my Patreon. Would love your support. But if not, honestly, the best thing you can do is check out my Discord. I'll have a link for that as well. Join my Discord. You can hang out. We talk all the time in there. Uh, and it's a great place for me to just connect with everyone else who enjoys this type of content. So my ending went way longer than I expected. Sorry that was so long. But again, thank you all for the support. I hope you enjo enjoyed this type of content. Give me some feedback. Let me know in the comments what you liked, what you didn't like, and what, kind, what other topics you'd like to see in the future. That's all I got. I'll catch you next time.